Hello, and welcome back to the Brightspace training series. This is the last module, module number four, Assessments and Grading. In this module, we will take a look at the assessments tools available in Brightspace, assignments, quizzes, and rubrics. And then we will take a look at the gradebook and the tools available to manage student grades. Let's get started with assignments. When we click on assignments, we are taken to a central location uh, where assignments are created and managed. You'll have a button for new assignments, an option to edit categories and group assignments under one main group or slot, and then more actions. You'll see a table with all of your assignments listed. And uh, on that table, you'll see the title of your assignment, the availability dates, and the due date as well. This is a sandbox, so there are no submissions currently, but you'll see new submissions listed here how many have been completed, how many have been evaluated, and whether the feedback has been published or not, or, or for how many assignments the, the feedback has been published. So let's start by creating a new assignment. This is the layout um, that you will see as well when you create a new quiz. The content creation happens on the left-hand side of your screen and the settings on the right-hand side. The first thing is um, the new assignment. So let's call this one Homework number one, goals and expectations. By default, uh, this appears as an ungraded item, but if you click on this box, it will automatically add it to the gradebook and create a box for points. Let's say that this assignment is worth 10 points. And if I click on this drop down menu, you'll see a few other options. There's one to edit or link to an existing item on the gradebook. So if you, pre if you created your gradebook first with all your columns and your items, then you can link this assignment to that particular item that has already been created. You can say that this is not in the gradebook. This is just something uh, that students need to submit, but it's not part of the gradebook. Or you can say that it's ungraded. So it, it will not um, have a box for points here. Then we have an option for due date. When I click on the calendar, I can select when this assignment is due. Let's say this is due on Friday, December 15th. And by default, it will give me end of day, but I can click on the box and I can select a different time. I can also type a specific time. So let's say 8 p.m., for example. Then we have a box for instructions. So this is where uh, uh, you can include all the info information and instructions you want your students to follow. You have the option to um, upload files, uh, record videos, insert links, external tools. You can also use the quick link tool to link to other items on your course. You can upload images and you have all your formatting options here. However, you probably or some instructors already have the instructions for their assignments in a separate document. So you can use the file upload uh, tool instead. So you have the option to include instructions here or upload a file or do both. The other option is to attach a link to an existing activity. If you want students to review something in your content area or review a discussion before they complete these assignments, you can link to those uh, items as well. Or you can also ex uh, link to external tools or resources that you want your students to review for this assignment. You also have the option to record audio or video to give your assignment a more personal touch. I'm going to click on save. This is a, a practice that I recommend. As I'm working on an assignment, I click on save to avoid losing my work if I have any issues with internet connection or my computer reboots, for example. Then let's take a look at the settings on the right-hand side. The first area is for availability dates and conditions. So uh, you can choose to leave these empty and that means that your assignment will become available as soon as you make it visible but you can also decide to make it available at a specific time. So let's say that this will become available on December 11th at 12.01 um, a.m. The first option that appears here is that it's visible with access restricted. That means that students will see it listed in the assignments list. And they will see the title, they will see this, the availability dates and due date, but they will not be able to open it and see the instructions, for example, or any files associated to it. If I change it to visible with submission restricted, 
Students will be able to open it. They can review all the materials and instructions associated to this, uh, to this assignment. However, uh, they won't be able to submit. And the other option is to keep them hidden altogether. And, and finally, you can add availability dates to the calendar and, and that helps students keep track of their work and get notifications when things become available for them. And the end date, same thing. You can just choose to leave it open uh, always, or you can hide it after a certain date. So I'm going to say this is going to become hidden uh, on this date. And again, you can choose what happens. Uh, visible with access restricted, visible with submission restricted, hidden, and then add availability dates to the calendar. So I'm going to say visible, but submission is restricted. Students can submit after the due date, but before the end date in this case. If they submit after the due date, you will get a notification that the submission was made late, but students will still have access to that submission box until this time. Then we have release conditions, and release conditions allow you to add certain parameters to when this becomes available to students. An example of a release condition can be that they have to read some content or review some content in your course before they have access to this assignment, or maybe they have to participate in a discussion board, or they have to get a, a specific score on a quiz. So you can click on add release condition and create a new condition for this. For students to be able to access this assignment, both the availability dates and the release conditions have to be met. Then we have special access and special access allows um, students with accommodation to have uh, individualized due dates or availability dates. So you can click on manage special access and you have two options. The first one is allow users with special access to submit outside the normal availability dates for this folder. That means that only students with special access will have specific dates for these. The second option will allow only users with special access to see this folder. That means that only those students will see this assignment at all. So in the case of an alternative assessment or a, 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 a remediation uh, or an, a special activity for some students in the class, you would choose the second option. Let's choose the first one and then you'll see that you have the option to change the due date. So maybe it's one week later, and you can also change the availability dates to, to meet the, the needs of those students. Uh, this is a sandbox, so I don't have students, but at the bottom, you'll see the list of your students. You can select them and then click Save. And finally, click Save and Close again. You can have multiple uh, instances of special access for different students that have different accommodations or circumstances. Next thing is submission and completion. So this uh, in, it refers to the type of submission that this is. The first thing is assignment type. It says individual assignment. And in this particular course, there are no groups. So I cannot change it to a group assignment. I would need to create groups first, and then I can make this a group assignment. Next is category. Uh, so if, for example, you have uh, an assignment or, or as a small assignment that happens every week. So at the end of the semester, you, you your, your students could have up to 14 submissions. You can create an assign a, a category for all of those um, activities. And then you can go to the gradebook and say, please average the grade of these assignments or drop the lowest two grades. So that's what categories are for. They're, they allow you to organize and group assignments based on specific characteristics or needs for your course. Then we have submission type, file submission, text to submission, on paper submission or observed in person. Uh, for example, if you have students demonstrate a skill in the classroom or deliver a presentation, you can still create your assignment in Brightspace. You can still add a rubric and you would provide feedback and grades through the system, even though this is happening in the classroom. So it allows you to take advantage of the wonderful feedback tools and the rubric tool that is in the system in Brightspace um, and keep everything organized in one place. The same thing for own paper submissions that happen in, in the physical classroom. And the other two are for entirely online types of activities. 
Then you can choose uh, how many files can students submit per submission, unlimited or one file. So unlimited, if it's a big project, students might need to uh, submit a paper that they wrote, but also a PowerPoint presentation and maybe an infographic. If that's the case, you would choose unlimited. If students only need to submit one thing, you can choose one file. Then we have allowable file extensions, depending on the type of assignment. The default is no restrictions, but you can choose one of these options as well. And then what happens with submissions? The first option is all submissions are kept. That means students can submit as many times as they need until the due date, and you'll have access to all of those submissions. Then we have only one submission allowed. So if students need to resubmit, you would need to reset that submission for them. And finally, only the most recent submission is kept. In this case, students can also submit as many times as they need during the availability period, but you will only see the latest submission. Next is evaluation and feedback. This is where you can add a rubric. You can create a new one, or if you have rubrics in your Brightspace course already, or you copied a previous course, then you'll have access to those rubrics here. You have an option to manage and add learning objectives that are associated with this assignment. By default, annotation tools are on. So when you're grading your students' work, you'll be able to add sticky notes, add comments, make annotations online in the system. And students will have access to these annotations. And finally, there is an option for anonymous marking. Uh, this means that you can hide students' name during the assessment process. However, this can only be turned on before submissions are made. After students have submitted, this setting cannot be changed. Okay, so those are all of the options to create a new assignment in the course. I can click Save and Close if I'm done. I can save if I need to continue working. And, and there's also a button to cancel. One other thing that I'd like to point out is that this is currently hidden. Even though I have availability start dates, if this is hidden, my students won't see it at all. So there's many different ways uh, to work with assignments. You might choose to keep it hidden until before the availability date, or you can make it visible right now. Students will see it listed on their assignments list, but they won't be able to access it until this date comes, depending on the conditions and selections you made here. Or in some cases, you might choose not to have availability dates at all and just keep it hidden until the moment that you want your students to access it. My preference is to have availability dates and make it visible because this way it will automatically become available to my students when they require uh, this assignment to be available and the process is automated for you. You can always come back, you can always edit and make changes to your selections, add more information, change links, uh, but it is important to remember that after students submit, there are, are some settings that cannot be changed. So I'm gonna click save and close. And now if I go back to my list of assignments, it is here, homework one, goals and expectations. And you'll see an icon here that looks like a ribbon. Uh, and that means that this assignment has an assessment. The This other uh, icon means that this assignment is hidden. And you'll also see different uh, icons for group assignments or if uh, an assignment has release conditions. So that is an assignment. If I go to my grade book, uh, I'm gonna go into grades and this is where you would see a list with all of your students. There are currently no users in this class so I don't see a spreadsheet here. I will show you that example in a different course. But if I go to manage grades, I can see that my homework assignment has been added to the manage grades area. Under the Manage Grades area, you will see all the assignments that have been created in this course. Some are hidden, some are not included in the final calculation. I will come back here to take a look at this uh, very important page. This is the central location where you will manage uh, calculations and you will set up your gradebook and your final grades for your students. So let's go back to assessments and the next tool is quizzes. If you inherited a course, you probably have some materials here, here already. If you made a copy from one Brightspace course to another, 
you probably have some quizzes and assignments in the system already. You can always edit and change them or hide them or delete them as needed. But I'm going to start by creating a new quiz. The options and the, and the layout of this page is very similar to the one that we saw for assignments. There are a few more tools when we're creating a quiz. So the first thing is uh, the name. I'm going to call this Capitals of the World. And by default, again, this is not in the grade book and it says zero points, but I can choose to, again, edit or link it to something that already exists in the grade book if I created my items in advance, or I can add it to the grade book and it will create a new item for me. It says zero, but let's say that this is worth 10 points. And then I have an option for a due date. So let's say that this is going to be due again on December 15th by end of the day. And you can add a description to your test or to your quiz. And you'll see you have some formatting options here. And you also have uh, options to add uh, videos, for example. You can add links. You can add files from your computer. And you can even add tables, um, emojis, equations if needed. So there's a, there are a lot of tools to create a description for your quiz. And also when you're creating questions, you'll have these tools as well. So depending on how sophisticated or complex your questions are and how, and if you need different media, you'll be able to do that here. Okay, so this is gonna be test your knowledge about the capital cities of countries around the world. Next, we have the area to create questions. You can add existing questions from a question library. Every time you create questions and a quiz in Brightspace, all of those questions are added to the question library so you can reuse them. You can also upload a file, um, a CSV file or a zip file with a previously created quiz. These files must have a very specific format. And if you click on upload a file, you can download a template uh, to create your questions um, and then uh, uh, import them as a bulk into Brightspace. But for example, if you have a, a test from a previously created Brightspace course, you can download that exam as a zip file and then you can upload it into a new course or in, upload questions into a, new, into a new quiz as well. And I also have the option to create new questions. There's many types of questions. We will take a look at a few today. There's also an option for a section if you wanna group some questions together. This is a great tool for case studies uh, if you if you ask your students to read a case study and then respond a few questions based on that text, then you can group those questions together. Uh, or if you want to organize your quiz uh, in different sections, you can do that as well. And you can also have question pools that allow you to um, select from a larger group of questions. Let's say you have 20 questions in your pool and every student will get 10 different questions out of that pool. So essentially, students will be getting different questions um, in the in this particular quiz. So let's start by a new question. I'm gonna do multiple choice. I will get a pop-up window where I can create my multiple choice question. If I made a mistake, I can actually change the type of question right here. I don't have to go back. There are some options like adding feedback for each answer, adding a hint, adding a short description, adding custom weights and enumeration. So my question is, uh, so this is a, a test or a quiz about the capitals of the world. So I'm gonna start with what is the capital of Venezuela? The answer is Caracas. So I can write that answer and then I can select it as correct. Then I'll continue with the other options. You'll notice that you can remove uh, answers if you need less than four, and you can also add more here. Okay, so all of these are Venezuelan cities, but the capital is Caracas. You can choose to randomize the order. So if I am, you'll notice that you can actually uh, reorder the answers yourself if you want them in a particular order. But if you want to randomize them, every student will get them in a different order. Then that option is no longer available and each student will get it in a different order. On the right-hand side, you'll see a preview of what your question is gonna look like. 
I selected enumeration, so there's A, B, C, D, E over here. I can actually change the type of enumeration to numbers uh, and Roman uh, numerals or letters and capitalized or lowercase. So you have a few options there. And then you can change how many points this question is worth. So my question is ready. I can click on save, but there are a few more options. I can say save and new if I want to create another multiple choice question, or I can say save and copy if my questions have a similar format and I just have to change a few words. This can help you save time. I'm going to do that, save and copy. So the next, um, for this question, for the next question, I'm going to say, what is the capital of Portugal? So the capital of Portugal is Lisbon. And I'm going to be changing some of these answers. Okay. Go. And I'm actually only going to need four options for this one. And let's say this, this is the last option. The capital is Lisbon. So I can see the preview. It hasn't been updated. I might need to just click outside of that last box to see my question updated. I'm going to randomize the answer order. And yes, it's only one point. Okay, I'm going to add a new question. Oh, I, I clicked on save. So now I can see my two questions are listed here. I can reorder these questions. I can select it and I can make more actions such as deleting a question, toggling bonus, toggling mandatory or setting points. I'm not going to do that now. I'm actually going to create a new question. I'm going to go back to new question, multiple choice. And this time I'm going to choose what is the capital of Burkina Faso? So the capital is Ouagadougou, which is such a beautiful world, word and one of my favorite uh, capitals in, in Africa. Okay, so then I, I'm going to add a few other options. So let's do a few other African cities. I select the right answer, which is Ouagadougou. I'm going to randomize it as well, and I'm going to keep the enumeration. So now I have created three multiple choice questions and you'll notice that the question is listed here with the type of question underneath and the points to the right. I can always select the question if I need to make changes or edit it. And now let's try to create a different type of question. Um, so there's true or false, fill in the blanks, multi-select, matching, ordering, written response, short answer, arithmetic, significant figures and multi-short multi -short answer. So there's many types. Let's choose one about written response. So this one's gonna be, what is your favorite season and why? Again, you'll see the options to edit my question. You can enable the HTML editor for learner response. If you do that, they'll have more options to edit their questions. They can add images, they can add links, they can create more uh, sophisticated responses. Otherwise, it's just plain text, which can be enough in, in many situations. So I'm going to enable HTML editor. And there's also an option to allow learners to insert images and attachments. So for example, if it's a math question or if it's a, a chemistry exercise where students actually need to show their process and take a picture of their work and upload it, then you would choose that option as well. And I'm going to make this question worth three points and save. So now I have my questions here, but let's say that I want to create a section. I'm gonna click on section, and this section is gonna be called a case study. Um, and then I can choose to hide the section title from learners. In this case, I'm gonna keep it. And then please, I'm gonna add a section text. Please read the following case study and respond to the next four questions based on that information. And again, I can shuffle the questions in this section. So the questions will stay together always because they're, they, they are part of the same section. Uh, but within that section, you can choose to, to shuffle those questions. So I'm gonna say save, and I can see a preview of what my title and description is gonna look like. Now it's here. 
But how do I quest add questions to the case study? I actually need to drag and drop. So let's imagine that these two questions go into the case study. I'm gonna select this icon on the left-hand side and I'm gonna drag and drop it inside the case study. I'm gonna do the same thing for this third question. So now you'll notice, oh, it didn't go in. Let's try it again. So you should, uh, it's you can notice now that these questions are nested under the case study. So when students, uh, even if you choose to to randomize the order of all the questions or shuffle all the all the questions in the test, the case study questions will remain together, but they will be shuffled inside the case study. And, and then we can create a question pool. So the question pool requires that there are questions that have been previously created in the question library. So this, let's call this question pool one. And I'm gonna browse my question library. And uh, I'm gonna look at some of these other uh, tests that I have created. So there's nothing in my question library because I haven't added questions to the library, but I do have access to previously created tests or exams. So I'm gonna see this one. Uh, there's nothing there, but maybe there's something here. Okay, I do have some questions here. So I'm gonna choose this one and this one and this one, even though they're they're actually uh, uh, duplicates of questions that I created in this example, I'm going to import these into my pool. So I have three questions in my pool, but I wanna show each one of my students two questions out of these three. So one point uh -huh. per question, that's fine. I'm gonna save. And now I have a question pool. I have some questions that are independent. I have a case study that has two questions. And then I have a question pool and from three questions, each student is gonna get two. I'm gonna click on save to save my work so far. And if I go up, it says that the total points adds up to eight. And the, the points for the total quiz for, the, for, for this quiz is 10. So it actually does not update based on these total points from the questions. And if you leave it like this, the system will automatically do the calculations and the equivalency for you. You can choose to change it to eight to make it consistent. You can choose to modify the points of each question if you need to get to a certain point, but rest assured that uh, even if they're different, this one and this one, uh, the system will do the calculations and the, and the, and the equivalency for you. Okay, so we have that ready, our content is ready. Now let's take a look at some availability dates and conditions. We have start dates, end date, and we have release conditions, special access, and password. Uh, start date and end date are um, similar to what we saw in an assessment and an assignment. The same for release conditions. Special access is different. There are more options here. This is where you'll be able to change not only the date of the exam or the due date, uh, availability dates or due date, but also number of attempts and, and uh, timing for your quiz and what happens after the timer has expired. You also have an option to add a password. Then we have timing and display. You can set a time limit. Let's say that I wanna give my students 10 minutes for these tests. And there are some interesting timer settings here. You can make it asynchronous. And that means that the timer starts when the learner starts the quiz. So within that availability time frame, students will get 10 minutes as soon as they start the test. Or there's also an option for a synchronous test. And that means that when the availability time starts, let's say the availability time is um, Monday at 10 a.m. At 10 a.m., it will start for everyone and the, everybody will get 10 minutes after that. Then we have what happens when the time limit expires. There's an option for automatically submitting the attempt, flagging that the time limit has been exceeded, but the learner can continue working or doing nothing. The time limit is not enforced. So these options um, can be modified for students with accommodations under managed special access. My recommendation is that you set up timing and display first, and then you go back to manage special access and make changes there. There's also an option to change the paging and how questions are displayed to students, all questions displayed together, one question, five questions per page, 10 questions, or, or adding a page break after each section. 
If you choose one question per page, there's going to be an option that prevents students from going back. There's also an option to shuffle questions and sections within the quiz. But again, as I said, the questions within this, this, the sections will remain together. There's an option for allowing hints if you have created hints for your questions. And then there's an option to disable email, instant messages, and alerts within Brightspace while the, take, the test is taking place. There is also an option for adding a header and a footer. And I really like this option. If there is a link that you want your students to visit during the test, you can add it at the header of the footer. If there's a reminder that you want students to think about or be, or, or be um, aware of while they're taking the test, you can add it to the header and the footer. Or if, for example, there are formulas that you want your students to access during the test, you can also add those to the, to the header or footer. Next is attempts and completion. You can give students one attempt, 10, unlimited, and you can also choose how the grade is calculated. Again, you can also uh, group quizzes in categories and, and that will help you manage grades in the gradebook later. Finally, evaluation and feedback. By default, if this is a quiz that only has multiple choice and uh, questions that are graded automatically, then results will be are auto-published immediately upon completion and they synchronize with the gradebook. This is the default, but you can always turn these options off. And, and when students finish, they will see the attempt grade. And again, you can turn these off and you can also add more things. Like once they finish, they see the grade, but they also see incorrect questions with correct answers, or they see incorrect questions without the answers, or all the questions with all the answers or all the questions without the answers. This can happen immediately after students finish, but you can also customize quiz results displays by creating an additional view and selecting a date when these results will be available. So maybe students finish their test and a few days after that, you want to discuss and review results in class. Then you can make a, an, an additional view available so that students can review the questions and the answers, their answers, what they got right, what they got wrong. So this is available here. And finally, you can also match learning objectives with this particular quiz. So those are all the settings available when you create a quiz. And this is hidden here, but my test is always available. So if that's the case, I wanna keep it hidden. I can also make it visible and select an availability date and an end date as well. I have a due date, so my end date has to be after my due date and I can add availability dates to the calendar. I'm gonna keep it like that this time. Okay, so the test will become available on December 11th. I save and close. And now my test is here and it's been added to the list of future quizzes. It's happening uh, in, on December 11th, it will become available. So that means I, I selected the asynchronous option. So after this time, my students can launch the quiz and after they launch the quiz within this frame they will get 10 minutes to complete it again this also has an assessment you can see the icon here that includes an assessment or has a great item if i go back to my grades and i go back to manage grades now i have my uh, my quiz here as well so uh, the next tool under assessments is rubrics here, I don't have any rubrics, but you have the option to create new rubrics. I'm gonna to go to a different course to show you an example. So these, uh, these are rubrics that have been created in advance. This rubric has a lock because it cannot be edited or deleted because it is associated with an assignment. I, however, can make a copy. And now this copy, I can modify it and I can make changes. But after I add a rubric to an assignment, and after that assignment has submissions, then it cannot be modified. So I'm gonna show you what this would look like. Uh, this is my rubric. It ha I have the criteria um, on this first uh, column, and then I have columns for the different levels of, uh, of achievement and the final score over here. And um, this rubric, well, this one cannot be edited, so I'm 
We're going to go back to the copy so that I, you, you can see how it can be edited. Uh, so you'll see that you can add more uh, categories uh, or uh, different things you're evaluating. You can add more levels of expectation as well. And then you'll have a, an area to put the points for each one of those uh, categories or, or levels of expectation. You can add descriptions and you can even add feedback, initial feedback. So if a student got exceed expectations for research, then this automatic feedback will be shown to that student, but you can always provide personalized feedback when you're grading a student paper or an assignment. Uh, so this is just initial feedback that is generic, but then you can provide more details and, and actionable items for your students. You can add criterion as well, uh, and you can also add criteria group. So in this case, uh, these criteria have all of both of these criteria have three levels of expectation. But if you have another criteria that actually has four levels of expectation, you can add a new criteria group and add a new level and then make the changes accordingly. And you'll you'll notice that there's analytic and holistic rubrics. So holistic rubrics do not have uh, criteria, only have an overall description or way of assessing the work and then levels of expectation. So it's a more general analytic will divide the work into different items or categories um, that you're, uh, you're evaluating. You also have custom points or points. So points, if you select points, then um, it's the same uh, points for each one of the levels. So 10, 7.5, 5. But I'm in custom points where I can actually say this is actually 12 points and this is going to be 6 and this is going to be 3. So you can change the value of, of, of each category by using custom points. You can also reverse the level order. At this moment, this is saved as a draft um, and the changes are saved automatically as you work. So I'm gonna close and my rubrics are here, they're stored. I can see that some are drafts, some have been published and then you can add them to the different assignments that you create. So now let's take a look at the grades. This is not a real course and these are not real students, but I want to show you this great uh, area because it has names and it, it, it will show you how a great book can look and how you can modify it. So here we have the great book and uh, with the students, uh, the student names on the left hand side. You have a column for final grades and then you have the different items on your grade book. This view is called a spreadsheet view, and the spreadsheet view allows you to enter grades here. If I go to switch to standard view, so here on the top left, if I switch to standard view, I'm going to say no, do not save changes. Now the standard view doesn't really um, allow me to make any changes. So. If I am grading an assignment, the grades will automatically be published here in the spreadsheet, in the standard view. But if I need to make manual changes, I need to change to switch to spreadsheet. And then I have these boxes where I can enter grades manually. Uh, you also have the option to import and export your gradebook if you prefer to work elsewhere. Um, and then you have an option to search for users. Okay, there we go. We have a student, and then you can search it like that. And then we have here more actions and options to hide and show columns in your gradebook. I think um, the most important tools in the gradebook um, are, of course, the enter grades area where you can manually see grades and you'll see the calculations of students, how students are doing, but also manage grades, as I showed you earlier, and the setup wizard. The setup, the setup wizard will take you through a series of steps to, to get to make the most important decisions about how your grades are calculated, how they're shown to your students. So let's go through that process. Um, and I'm gonna do that in my other course. So I'm gonna go into grades and then into setup wizard. And here uh, you, you can see my current uh, selections, but I'm gonna click on start and, and take you through that process. So by default, it's set up with points. So if your grades, uh, if your assignments and quizzes and all of those add up to 100, you might choose to use points. But in some cases, 
they do not add up to 100 and you want to use weighted so that you can add percentages to each item. I'm going to choose that option now. There's also an option for formula. Next step is power final grades released. Do you want a calculated final grade based on those percentages and points? Do you want an adjusted final grade column? This will allow you to make modifications and adjust users' grades when needed. And then there's an option to automatically release final grades. And, and this will happen automatically at the end of the semester. You can always release grades earlier if you choose to do so. So I'm going to keep it like this. Continue. Next step is what happens with grade calculations. Are you dropping ungraded items or are you treating ungraded items as a zero? So if you drop ungraded items, let's say you have evaluated 50 points so far out of the 100. If you're dropping ungraded items, the grade will be calculated, the percentage of the grade will be calculated based on that 50. So if a student has 40 out of that 50, then um, that will um, calculate to 80% uh, of their grades so far. However, if that's a, if you use treat ungraded items as zero, even though you're great, you have graded 50 points, it's going to take a look at the 100 points in your course. And that student that got 40, has 40 so far, would have a percentage of 40%. So it's up to you on how you want to, to, to show calculations to your students. It, it, this relates to the running total that we had in Blackboard. So it's either dropping ungraded items. And if that's the case, be aware that the, the points will vary from student to student based on students that have submitted things and students that have not submitted some things. And also considering grades that you have entered and grades that you have not entered yet. And then the grades will be automatically updated. Next step, step number four, do you want to use a percentage scheme or you wanna use the GBC default grade scheme? And if you take a look at the preview, it just shows you how the points translate into letters according to GBC uh, policies. So I'm gonna keep it at percentage. Next step is how many decimals you wanna include. It says two, you can change it if you need to. Then the student view display. So they're gonna see points grades, they're gonna see weighted grade. They can also see the grade scheme symbol, so the letter, and you can also show them a color. So there's colors to indicate green if they're above a certain percentage, yellow, and then red if they're under a certain percentage. How many decimal students see, how many characters they see for text items, and then there's an option to show students the calculation of how your grades are being done. Final step is a summary. So I'm gonna finish. And I'm gonna go back to manage grades. So in manage grades, I have a column or I have a table, excuse me, with all the assignments that I have, assignments, quizzes, activities that I have created in Brightspace. And uh, you'll see the name here. You'll see whether they're hidden or not. You'll see the type and association. Association is very important. Association means that this is linked to an assignment or to a quiz or to something created in the course. You can always add items. I can, for example, I'm gonna add new item that's called, uh, it's also numeric, but it's gonna be community contribution. So this, I'm gonna use it to uh, give my students grades for, uh, sharing in, uh, resources in in the discussion board for helping out in the classroom, for collaborating and working in small groups, for participating in a discussion, for, for any type of interaction and engagement that my students have. And this may vary from student to student. So it's not only participation, but it's anything that my students do to contribute to the classroom community. So I'm gonna call it community contributions. It's gonna be, let's say five points of the final grade. And it's also going to be maybe 5%. So I'm going to save and close. I added that item to show you that that item doesn't have an association because it's not a quiz, it's not an assignment, nothing. And it's not a discussion. It's actually a grade that I will input manually. The others, you'll see assignments, external learning tools. So external learning tools can be turn eating assignments. This is the case for that. It could also be H5P items and H5P are interactive elements that you can create in your content and then you can connect it to the gradebook. Um, 
and then assignments, quizzes, discussions. I'm actually going to create a new category and I'm gonna call this category formative assessment. And, and these are just, or maybe not formative assessments, but maybe just low stakes assessment. So all of these little things that I have created in the course, just to show that my students um, are engaged or participating in, and responding to these short checking exercises, I'm gonna add them to that category. So what I'm gonna do is that this one over here, all of these external learning tools, I wanna add them. So I'm going to select this one, edit, and I'm going to add it to the category low stakes. I'm gonna do the same thing with this one as well. So I click on edit and I can click on category and I add them to that category. Okay, let's do it like this. Let's see if I have anything else. Okay, that's good. So now my percentage is uh, adding up to 95%, but I want to I want to make I have to add it up to 100%. So this reflection essay is going to be 10. That's fine. This assignment 10. But if I needed to change something, let's say that I want to change this low stakes assessment to only 5%. So I'm going to click on edit. And I'm going to say it's going to be 5%. And I'm going to um, distribute weights by points across all items in this category. So what I'm doing with that is that I'm just... Um, making it an average. So everything actually has the same points, I believe. Uh, so I have 5% and it's 10, 10, 1. Okay, so it's not not, not correct, 10, 10, 10, 1. I would need to probably change these two to one to make it uh, just an average and not these two more valid, valuable than this one. So I'm gonna click on capitals, edit, and I'm gonna make this one point. So these are just low, low stakes assessments. And, and then this one is as well. I'm gonna change it to one. So what's happening here is that in total, my low stakes assessment category is 5% of the final grade. And each one of these items is 33.3. .3. So it's equally, uh, these three items are equally uh, valued, uh, valuable uh, in terms of this final category. But I need to change some things. Let's see, for example, this homework has to be maybe 15%. So I click on edit. I'm going to make it 15%. You can also change the points if you if you wish. But this shows you that points and weights don't have to match. Uh, so as long as, uh, but you do need to get to 100%. So this is 95. So this first reflection essay also, I'm going to make it 15 so now uh, my grades should be adding to 100%. Here they are. The points don't really matter. They're adding up to 257, but my final calculated grade, the percentages uh, are adding up to 100%. One thing that uh, a very common question is, how do I delete items from the gradebook? You can delete items that don't have associations. For example, I could delete the community contributions by clicking on more actions, delete, and it's actually a two-step process. I need to click again and delete. I won't delete it because I want to keep it, but that's the process. It's a two-step process. You click on delete, then you select, and then you delete. But some of these items, all of these items are associated with something. I cannot delete them. I'll show you. More actions, delete. These boxes are cannot be selected, and it's because all of these items are associated with something. How do I delete them? I would need to separate the connection between this item and the assignment. So let's say, for example, I want to delete um, this course schedule sample. So I'm gonna go back into my assessments, assignments, and here where it says course schedule sample, I'm gonna edit the assignments, and I'm gonna say, this is not in the gradebook anymore. It's here, it's in Brightspace. I don't know if I'm gonna use it yet, but I don't want it in my gradebook. So now that my assignment is not in my gradebook, I can go back to grades. I can go back to manage grades. And now there's no association. So I can click here. Sorry, I have to click on more actions, delete. And then the course schedule I can select, I can delete. It's going to ask me one more time, are you sure you want to delete it? I say yes. 
And that's how you delete an item from the grade book. So it cannot be associated with an item. You would need to first separate that association and then delete the item on the grade book. So now my grades are adding up to 90%. So maybe I have to change this reflection essay to 25%. I'm going to do that. And there are so many more options uh, to review in the gradebook. You'll see that there's options for exceeding, for adding bonuses, for changing grading schemes, for changing how students see the grades. However, this is a, um, an introductory video to grading and assessments. If you have more questions, you can always connect with the Teaching and Learning Exchange at tlx at georgebrown.ca. You can uh, ask any questions you may have. You can book appointments with members of our team. One other thing that I'd like to show you before we finish this module is the class progress tool. The class progress tool will show you a list of all of your students and a, a summary of their system access, so how many times they have accessed Brightspace and, and the course in particular when you click on their names, content that they have completed, so there is a progress bar. Students also see this progress bar, and that is a great tool for them to keep track of their own uh, progress and learning and the materials they have reviewed, scores and quizzes, and grades. If I click on any of the student's name, I'm, I'm going to get even more information, information about specific content that they have reviewed. I can see folder by folder how they're doing. I can see their contributions to discussions, to assignments, to quizzes, to any material that I have created in the course, I can see how my students are doing. There's also the attendance tool where you can create a new register and then mark attendance in Brightspace. And finally, we have the quick eval. And the quick eval is for instructors to see the submissions of their students, the activities, and the things that they need uh, to, to work on. So this quick eval doesn't have anything because there are no students, but if I go to another sample course, and I show you the quick eval tool, you'll see the work you have pending. So how many posts I have to read, how many assignments, submissions I have. So this is like a operation center for faculty to see the work they need to do. So that is uh, an introduction to assessments and grading in Brightspace. As I said earlier, please feel free to connect to the with the TLX for more support and good luck with your courses.